Welcome everyone. We'll use this time uh, for just a kind of casual introduction to tonight's program. Um, I'm Brian Pontalillo, uh, editor of Green Building Advisor. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, from Fine Home Building, Rob Watsack, is also um, here with us tonight. Uh, we have Dan Colbert and Ben Bogey, our featured stars for the evening. Uh, Dan runs uh, Colbert Building in the Portland, Maine area, and Ben is Dan's uh, lead carpenter. Um, Dan's also responsible for uh, sort of the initiating the movement of building science and beer groups. And uh, Ben is, I believe, Dan's lead carpenter, also a second generation high performance home builder. Uh, worked with, uh, started off with, did you start off with your father, Ben? Yeah, I started off working for my dad. Tried to avoid the industry, but that didn't work. So yeah, well. it doesn't doesn't always work out so well. So these guys now work together. They build and remodel up in the Portland, Maine area. And um, when they get the opportunity to build new high performance homes, their go to wall assembly is a double stud system, and that is the subject of of tonight's uh, webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan and Ben. I'm Dan Colbert. Uh, my company, Colbert Building, is a very small uh, construction company in Portland, Maine. Um, ben and his family moved up here a couple of years ago, and I was fortunate enough to snatch him up. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming most of you have seen the fine home building article from this month's issue. That is the house that we are currently building. Things are obviously on hold because of the state of the world, um, but the pictures are all mostly from that house. Um, as Brian said, we'll watch the chat, so please uh, chime in there whenever you want, and we'll answer the questions as we can. I'm just going to give a quick intro, and then Ben is actually going to be doing most of the um, presentation tonight because he's smarter and better at SketchUp than I am. Uh, so I am. Um, as I say in the article, you know, every time we build a new house, I think about the wall section. And every time I keep coming back to double stud with dense pack cellulose. Um, and that article and tonight is really a lot about why we still think it's the best wall system. Um, the goals of it are uh, thermally, you know, you get a high R value, you get a fantastic thermal break. Our walls are typically 12 inches thick. So with two two by four walls, you end up with five inches clear between them. Uh, and that's obviously full of dense pack. Um, cellulose is a great material for a bunch of reasons, including that it's got very low embodied energy um, and uh, very low uh, uh, CO2 equivalent, meaning it does not require much CO2 to produce. Um, Another thing I like about it is the air barrier ends up accessible uh, and you can test your assembly pre-insulation pre too. Um, the drainage plane, I like double wall because uh, it's very easy to install your drainage plane. Um, it's on, you know, it's the standard construction before we all started insulating more. It's, it's, a, it's a two by wall with plywood on the outside or zip or whatever. So if you're going to do a membrane, it's right there on the outside of the sheathing. You don't have to worry about foam. Um, and your rain screen is also very easy to do. Um, you're not shooting through foam on, if you're doing or rock sole or whatever if you're doing exterior insulation. Um, in terms of vapor, I like it because uh, it's much easier to be open, vapor open to the exterior, which at least for those of us in New England is uh, the preference. You're not sealing up your exterior with, with non-permeable layers like foam. Also, uh, it's what's called a hygroscopic buffer, meaning that it, the cellulose can absorb moisture, sort of distributes itself, distributes the moisture uh, along the wall and then releases it in whichever direction uh, is better in terms of uh, humidity levels as it can. And obviously with borate treatment, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got good mold prevention. And then in terms of comfort, 
Um, assuming you're doing a reasonably good job of air sealing, you'll have very low uh, drafts. Uh, there's, there's very little stratification uh, in terms of from one floor to the other, uh, low temperature variation, and also it's incredibly quiet, especially when combined with triple glaze windows. Um, you know, that last part is not necessarily unique to double stud, um, but again, I find it that it's easier to achieve those results with it. Um, and then the benefits over the alternatives, uh, I think they're easy to build. You know, there's no, everything should be familiar to a reasonably competent carpenter. Um, it's just two by construction. Um, the interior wall is just a, basically a non load bearing partition wall. Um, and the exterior, in some ways it's easier because your exterior walls are two by four instead of two by sixes. So it's, you know, cheaper, it's easier to lift walls, et cetera. Uh, there are no, when you're laying out for the exterior wall, there's no intersecting walls. Those all intersect with the double wall. There's no interior corners to worry about. Um, the plumbers and electricians love it because they've got that five inch space in between the walls to play with. Uh, so it cuts way down on drilling. Um, and if you're installing your windows as outies, as we call them, you know, right on the sheathing, your window install detail is the same as it always was. Um, I also like it, as I said above, it's um, permeable in both directions. It can dry in both directions. Uh, and it works really well with dense pack cellulose. You get one insulation system in the entire house. Uh, it's foam free, which I like for environmental reasons and worker safety reasons. And you're not using bat insulation, which we all know is very hard to detail well. Um, I also think it's more pest resistant than exterior foam. We've all seen, uh, well, maybe we haven't, but a lot of, a lot of insects really like foam as, an, as, a, as a habitat, it turns out. Um, I was gonna talk about whole wall R values, but I think I'll let Ben do that. So that's really about it for my intro. Um, one interesting note, we're actually looking at a job where it's an existing house, so we're gonna have to do uh, a system that some other people do, which is eye joists on the exterior, dense packed with cellulose. So there'll probably be an article in there, but it will certainly be interesting for me. It'll be the first time in a long time that I've done a high R wall assembly that's not this one. So with that, I'm gonna dump it over to Ben. Hey, hey, everybody. Big things for me that track me to double stud walls um, is the fact that it doesn't change really anything that carpenters already know how to do. So when we start introducing new assemblies and new techniques and new materials is when we put ourselves at risk for issues. Um, and those issues can be, you know, bad flashing, bad sealing of wires. Everybody knows what can go wrong, you know carpenters who aren't familiar with the system. So a double stud wall system is something that every carpenter knows how to do. So we're not adding anything new to the game. So you're just adding another wall. So what I'll do is I'll screen share over here real quick and we'll walk through some of the details of our actual wall assembly and talk a little bit about constructability. Let's see. Okay, so hopefully everybody's seeing this now. So this is a uh, the illustration out of the article. And this shows just a general cross section of what one of our typical walls looks like. Um, so we start off here, if everybody can see my cursor, we have down here underneath our foundation, we're generally trying to build on top of a slab. Um, we do that because it minimizes the amount of concrete that we end up having to put into the building to create a full basement. We're trying to watch our embodied in all of our in all aspects of our build. So we're generally building as a slab on grade here with a typical frost wall. So we start off with four inches of EPS foam underneath sometimes six. It depends on the specific goals of the project um, with a thermally broken edge of the slab here with a six mil poly vapor barrier in between the foam and the poured concrete. So that vapor barrier comes up here and we hold it in place with a uh, rip of foam here at the edge. And what that does is it locks it in place. So when the guys go to pour concrete, everything's kind of there and it doesn't slide around. We don't have any issues. So what this is doing is this is our vapor, our slab from any vapor. Thus directing the vapor to the outside of the wall where it gets sealed. 
along with this air sealing tape right here at the bottom edge of the wall. So as we move up the wall here, it starts, this is our first line of control. You know, we have our four layers of a control, our four control membranes or four control surfaces in a building. We need to control air, we need to control water, we need to control vapor, and we need to control thermal. So this one right here is kind of doing three functions for us. So this is dropping, protecting our vapor coming from below the lab and the concrete right here from migrating up into our wall assembly. This is controlling our air infiltration at what's a traditionally risky joint right here in the building. You see a lot of assembly leakage in that area. Sorry, I'm okay. closing up something that we didn't mean to here. Um, it's really peculiar. Sorry, folks. All right, my computer is lagging a little slow here. So this drops, this blocks our vapor barrier, our vapor mig migration right here in the assembly. It drops our air infiltration at the beginning right there. And this also stops any incidental water splashback that could be happening from grade to the bottom edge of our sheathing, protecting it right there. Um, I really like the approach of using the tapes because uh, they're inspectable. Uh, I have a big thing that I push for any of our control surfaces to be inspectable. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of what I call faith methods. Sealing them in place and you put the assembly together and you just kind of cross your fingers and hope that it worked. You know, using these tapes outboard here, we're able to actually go and quality control after the assembly is put together and make sure that, that it is properly sealed. So we start here at the bottom of our wall. That's our first line of control. And we start moving up the wall. So maybe what I'll do is just tick through some of the assemblies here. So this is it. This is, you know, typical two by four wall. You know, every carpenter in the world knows how to do this. So frame two by four wall and we move along. Normally, this is a little detail. Is these are three quarter inch pad outs because we're going to be putting a three quarter inch thick rain screen right here. I want to bring those on this project, particular piece of the rain screen. We don't want to do an extension jam. So, on this project, we uh, you know pad it out with three quarter inch plywood here to bring the windows out to that plane. So, it's got working along with sheathing right here. So it's going along at the bottom of the wall right here and installing the split release tape. Uh, this is Sega Fentrim 100. It's a four inch tape. It has a split release backer. So what we do is we pull one of the backers off this area on the back of the tape, affix it to the wall, and we leave this backer still attached to the tape. So that way, you know, it's on, it's properly shingle lapped with the WRB coming down over it. And then we install our WRB. So, um, in this project, and I got this question from a friend last night, um, he said, why did we go with a self-adhered membrane on this one? Um, in, in all honesty, I like to try uh, new products. I'm always, you know, when there's products coming from manufacturers that I trust, I like to try them out and give them a shot. So that was a big part of the decision to use the self-adhered on this. You know, this is Sega, my best 500 SA. Sega makes beautiful products. So we gave it a, a, a go on this house. One of the other contributing factors to this is this site sits uh, kind of in an open fielded area. So it sees a lot of wind constantly. And I was a little concerned that if we had used a mechanically attached WRB, you know, the typical roll on uh, staple up house wraps uh, that we were gonna have issues with wind ripping and damage. So it, yes, it's an additional cost to go with something like this, but we know that we're getting a really, really robust control layer with a self-adhered like this. So you're not gonna have any issues with air leakage through it. You're not gonna have any issues with water leakage through it. Um, it's gonna control you know, any pocketing and so on if you get any holes in it of water building up behind it. So as we work our way across, we get our uh, WRB on. And we don't have an in-between photo here, but you can see we try and do as much work on the wall when we have the wall laying on the ground because it's a heck of a lot easier to work with it down on the ground than it is off of ladders and staging. So we went right across here. This at the bottom is a piece of core event SV5, side event five. It's a piece of corrugated plastic with an insect screen across the bottom. This X is the closure for the bottom of our rain screen cavity right here. So it allows air to flow up into the cavity, it allows water to drain out, but it doesn't allow any insects to pass through. 
So we go ahead and we staple that on with cap staples, apply as much of our strapping as we can. You can see there's pieces emitted right here probably because it died into that window and we wanna do some of our flashing details before we integrate that strapping. So we try and get as much of the work done on the ground as we possibly can. Um, pieces of the self-adhered WRB around the opening are uh, scored on the back with a, what's called a top sheet cutter knife. If you look back through Find Home Building three or four months ago, I had a review in there showing this knife, which allows you to score the release paper on the back of the WRB and only re remove part of the, uh, the release membrane. So this allows us to pull off as much of the materials we need to and then leave some of the release liner on the back of it so that we can properly integrate it with our sill pan flashings here on the windows later when we get into window prep. Uh, always trying to get everything in shingle style fashion for any of our water control as much as possible. Um, though with a lot of these newer tapes and products, we can kind of ignore some of that because they're self-terminating. So here we are, you know, typical two by four wall situation. We stand them, put them up. Um, now this is coming to our, at the top of the wall. So uh, I said something before that I have a thing about inspectable control layers. Um, I like also rigid control layers. So right here, what we do is we end up using OSB for our air control layer across the bottom of our ceiling diaphragm. So once our exterior wall is stood, you can see right here, we have a flap of our WRB that's on the outside here, still sticking up with the release paper on the back of it. We left that on there on purpose. So we can now go around and put some 7 16 zip. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna make the turn of our air barrier from the wall plane to the horizontal of the bottom of our trusses. So we go ahead and we nail on 12 inch, or I'm sorry, 16 inch rips of a 7 16 zip onto the top of the wall and choose because this is gonna see some weather exposure. It's gonna stand up a little bit longer while we get this field of trusses on top of it. So it won't degrade as quickly as commodity OSB. So we staple this or nail this down onto the top of the wall plates and we take and fold our uh, self-adhered WRB on the outside over onto this top flange, thus continuing our air barrier can all the way over to this horizontal plane now. Alternatively, if you were using something like a zip or a weather mate or any of these integrated WRB panels on the outside of your building, you could just take and run a joint of tape along here. Um, the reason I really like rigid control barriers like this is I've had issues in the past with some of the fabric style membranes. Um, they are great in theory and they can work really well, but you have to be very delicate around them. And sometimes it's hard to police and manage subs. Um, when you have electricians and electricians helpers and plumbers helpers coming through with whole hogs and trying to bore holes up through those things, they can get shredded pretty easily and you can lose a bunch of time and having to go back and fix them and read detail around them. So I really like, you know, OSB is about the same cost per square foot as some of the better quality air control membranes and vapor control membranes. So the costing is a little bit of a wash and it makes it that much simpler for us to monitor what's going on and really see that all our connections are good. So um, at this point, we've got the roof on the building. Uh, layout for the second interior wall is, you know, it's super you take and stick your plates up against the wall here, go across the combination square and transfer all your layouts. And then you frame the wall, da, 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 frame the wall and you stand it up. You know, it's typical two by four wall framing. Um, I often get questions from people or they see, uh, I don't stagger our studs from inside to outside. Uh, you can, if you're in a situation where you really think that you can get an economy of materials by changing your interior layout so it breaks out better for sheetrock, that's an option. I also get questioned a lot about it because people think that there's gonna be you know, thermal bridging right there because they're in line with one another, the amount of energy transfer between those two studs through five inches of continuous insulation between those two walls is negligible. So that's really not a concern. So uh, walls get stood up. Uh, we have, I'm trying to see if there's a great way to show it here. So on our exterior walls, we have double top plates uh, and double bottom plates. And interior walls, we have double bottom plates and single top plates. And this is to create an inch and a half service space 
at the top of our wall here. You can kind of see it right up here. So what this does now is this gives us a service cavity entrance um, for any wiring and even some PEX plumbing if needed that we can bring from out of our wall right up and through into the ceiling service cavity that'll later get strapped, which means that we can run a lot of our uh, you know, services through the ceiling cavity up here without ever having to puncture this control layer. So now we have less ceiling that we have to do by going back and taping, caulking, so on and so forth. So the electricians literally can run their wires right through in between the two walls, staple them to the studs, come up, pull it right over the top plate here, and then run across the ceiling to wherever their fixture is. So electricians, most of them usually love working in these uh, styles of framing because it allows them to just blow right through their rough end. So here we are, just run a drywall lift and throw up 716th OSB across our ceiling. Come back and tape it off with the whatever flavor tape joy. This is 3M8067. Uh, I favor this for the interior because it's a little bit less expensive than some of the other tape products, but still performs just as well. And that kind of takes us a little bit through the constructability of this typical assembly. So I don't know, Brian, do we have any questions that are popping up right now before we shift into another section of this? We do. Um, Dan's been answering uh, a bunch of them as, um, as they've been asked in the chat box, but maybe a few of them uh, would be worth just um, uh, getting, giving you, the, you guys the opportunity to elaborate on, and uh, maybe then everyone will be privy to the answers if they're not paying attention to the, uh, to the chat box. Um, one of the first questions that came up, and um, I know that we had this question about the articles that you guys have worked on is about uh, vapor control on the interior. So maybe you could, uh, you guys could address that. Um, the, you, in this case, you don't have a specific uh, vapor retarder on the interior of the walls. Well, we have the drywall. Which yeah, is... we're uh, using. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so we're using the Drywall and latex paint is our vapor barrier, which by the IRC categorizes as a class three vapor barrier, um, which in our climate coupled with a ventilated rain screen on the outside is all we need. Um, if we were not doing a ventilated rain screen or we were in a, a colder climate, us if we're in climate zone 6A, if we're pushing into seven or up into Canada and eight, then you definitely want to step up or tighten up the permeability of that interior control layer, possibly to a full barrier at that point. Um, something to mention, a common fear that we hear a lot about double stud walls is a um, decade or so ago when these were really starting to take off, um, people were doing energy modeling with them and they were saying that we were gonna have issues with these walls rotting in cold climates. And what that's from is, is during the winter, the end of the winter, you get a, a buildup of moisture driving from the interior of the building into the wall assembly over the winter, and it collects in the wall assembly. And the fear was is that it can condense on the backside of the sheathing, resulting in rot or mold. So computer models told us this was going to happen. The math said this was going to happen. People were building these walls, and we weren't seeing it happen. So the reason it's not happening is, well, well, number one, we're using cellulose, which has a great ability to absorb and redistribute moisture. Um, we're also finding out that computer models don't really predict reality all the time. Uh, Joe Stieber had a great comment years ago that really stuck with me, is we don't give buildings. Um, so we think that our math is really showing, you know, what's going to happen. But, you know, it's really a complex system when you start putting all this stuff together. Uh, the other part of the equation is, is by having that rain screen on the outside, it's allowing uh, a greater level of drying. So you're getting airflow movement and convective currents happening on the outside of the wall there. It's drawing that moisture outside. So another key to this is everybody says, you know, well, what about mold? Well, the thing is, is that the, the conditions when condensation could be happening inside of your wall, where the moisture content could be high enough for mold to exist, the temperature is below any conditions that exist in. So what's happening is, is maybe your wood is getting a little bit wet in there, worst case scenario. We're not talking like physical condensed water, but the wood moisture content is going up. That wood is going to dry out and there's no problem with wood getting wet as it's allowed to out. So 
there was this big worry that our walls were going to be routing out and what we discovered is, is as long as we're using a, a, a rain screen on the back side of our walls and you know making sure that we've got good air sealing that there's no concerns so and we can if we want to dive into it a little bit further later with some of the monitoring we're doing and some of the old walls that we've cut in that prove this point. So um, two, two other components that have been asked about, uh, you guys have definitely addressed why you choose cellulose. And I think um, you talked a little bit about, or at least in the, in the article you did about um, why you choose plywood for sheathing, but we had questions about using alternative insulation. So someone asked, is rock wool uh, or mineral wool an option? And then we also read the same question about sheathing, is, is zip system sheathing an option? So maybe you could talk a little bit about not, we know now why you like what you use, but are other insulations and other sheathings viable options in this system? Uh, I'll take the first one. Um, and let Ben take the second yeah, one. Go, go um, for it. The you can certainly use other insulations. Um, you don't, you know, there really aren't any other insulations, uh, except for some obscure products that have that same moisture absorption and, uh, you know, the, that absorb and give up moisture in the same way. Um, so, you know, somebody asked about smart membranes earlier. I think if I wasn't using cellulose, I would definitely use a smart membrane. Um, and I think I even, I think I talked about that in the article. Um, but on the other, you know, the, on the other piece of it, um, you know, like rock wool, which is what the person was asking about, you know, it takes a ridiculous amount of energy to produce that stuff. Um, I, I don't, and it's expensive. I think it would be cost more to do it in rock wool. So I, I would, I, you can, but I don't, I wouldn't for environmental costs uh, and uh, the, other reasons. And Ben, if you want to talk about the sheathing, go ahead. To expand on, yeah, to expand on that a little bit though, is that, you know, it's, we exist in the Northeast and we, cellulose is readily mm -hmm. available and it's come to us over the past couple of years that throughout the rest of the country, it's not. Um, essentially with this wall system, you can go ahead and use any type of fibrous insulation you want. So, you know, cotton, wool, mineral wool, whatever, any of the fibrous insulation, that's or below. If you're not using cellulose, it's not a bad idea to step up to a vapor retarder on the inside. You know, one of the intelligent vapor modulating, you know, uh, retarders on the interior, um, just to kind of hedge your bets a little bit because those insulations don't have the ability to redistribute moisture like cellulose does. Um, and as far as sheathing goes, uh, you can use whatever you want. Um, we've used OSB and zip on houses and we have monitoring them and they're all performing well. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is the takeaway from this is if you're going to use an OSB based product, you absolutely have to make sure that you're using a rain screen on the outside. Uh, I was having a conversation with Joe Stebrick last week in regards to some of these details. And he says, yeah, you can absolutely use any of the fibrous insulation where you run into issues is when you use OSB on the outside and you don't back vent the cladding. It says every other assembly that we've put together, you can have OSB and back vented cladding. You can have plywood and not back vented cladding. You're okay. Still, we go belt and suspenders. We're trying to build a building that handles moisture for a 200 year time scale. So we're using uh, CDX here because it, it opens up to PERM 21 when it's wet, much higher than any of the OSB or ZIP products, which are around a PERM 3. So we're getting much better drying capacity. And really that's not to deal with anything inherently in the wall system. That's to deal with the unintended that are gonna happen over the course of that building's life. You know, cable installer is going to come along and we all know what cable installers do. They're going to drill holes wherever the heck they want. You know, in 50 years when the house has been sold, you're going to get water into that wall. If we have a higher permeability wall assembly, it's going to allow that wall to handle that unintended moisture better and dry out and stand a better chance of lasting. So that's really what it's all about for us on the permeability end. Also, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, we are, we're in a specific location, right? We're in Northern New England. Um, you know, we get to Hawaii, you know, other parts get even colder than Portland, but uh, specific. So if you're in San Diego or whatever, you know, it, it's, uh, 
I don't, I don't I've never at all. Uh, they're definitely different, different, you know, all of those things. So. Uh, something else that we have, sorry, something else we haven't mentioned yet is, is you know, the, we're showing a 12 inch thick wall. You don't have to build a double stud wall to 12 inches thick. You know, if you're building up in zone eight or nine in Northern Canada, you might want to go to 16 inches thick. If you're building down in the heartland of the US, you might want to just go with a 10 inch thick wall or a nine inch thick wall. You can tune this assembly however you need uh, in order to get what your goals are. Gotcha. It looks like we uh, looks like we lost Dan. Hopefully he'll he'll get back in here um, in a moment. Uh, uh, ben Justin asked um, if you can explain a little bit more how the ventilated cladding solves the potential problems with low perm sheathing. It gives it. Place so how ventilated cladding is? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Ben. So. So ventilated cladding, the, the way that it deals with uh, the low permeability is, is if the water vapor always moves from more to less, okay? So if you have a very tight membrane like OSB and it's staying on the outside because you have wind-driven rain stuck behind the siding, you're not going to have a good possibility for moisture to move from the wall into an already wet environment. So if you have a back ventilated cladding and it's keeping that space behind the siding dry and uh, you know, free of water vapor, then you're gonna have the ability for moisture to move from inside of the wall to that drier space behind the cladding. Cool. Um, we could, I, I, should, I probably should have jumped in with this, this question earlier while you had the drawing up. Uh, maybe you can pull it back up if it's helpful. But um, Steve Dimitrik had asked, how do you connect the sub-slab poly to the capillary break under the load-bearing exterior wall? Yeah, I, I, I tried to answer that. I realized the first time I answered it, it was just to the panelists, but I cut and pasted later. But um, the short answer is, we, you know, we've tried to do the, we've tried to do the poly um, and uh, it usually, you know, it often gets, in this case, certain, well, in this case, it didn't get trashed. The flat work guys just cut it right out. Um, so it didn't even, didn't even get a chance to get trashed by their uh, power trowel. But sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so in this case, we used, you know, we used some wide tape. I don't even remember what we used. Ben found something particularly wide. I think it might have been a, uh, I don't even remember what product it was, but it was, you know, a 12 inch tape or whatever it was to cover that up. Vicor Pro. Pro. Yeah. yeah, it was Vicor Pro. Yeah, I, I pulled up to the job site at about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, you know, sun was just coming up and I get out of my truck and watch the first guy out of the concrete guy's truck just take his razor knife and just start going right across the side of the building. And before I could say it, would already been around the building and cut our vapor barrier off. So that was less than ideal, but real world. Yeah. Uh, Steve, Steve would also like to know when you're talking about OSB, are you are you talking also are you including zip, zip sheathing with with other OSB? Yes. Yeah. Yes, zip is OSB. Let me tell Steve to shut up. <laughs> Getting feisty. So yeah, you, 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 treat him the, you treat him the same way. Um, and then, uh, so it's just a, an interesting little thing that we can talk. Sorry, Brian. An interesting little thing that we can talk about in the same vein. My internet connection is unstable. In the same vein is uh, permeabilities with sheathing. If you were building this assembly in a very cold climate like northern Canada, you could get rid of plywood as your exterior sheathing and go to glass face gypsum sheathing like they use on commercial buildings because it's even that much more vapor open. So you can deal with moisture even better in colder climates. Just you can really tune these assemblies. And someone had asked earlier about, and Dan did reply to this, but maybe it's worth discussing a little bit. Um, and, and, and Mike had a follow up question. Someone had asked about um, applying the, um, the self adhere WRB before you have your sheathing inspection and the inspector not being able to see the, the nailing pattern. Um, and Dan explained that you guys don't have, um, you guys don't necessarily have inspections where you're building, but do you have any thoughts on, on that? If you were somewhere, would you just simply have to 
have to proceed differently? Yeah, I guess yeah, so. it might be would, something um, where we'd use where we'd use seam tape or something so that you know so they could see the sheeting nails, or just do it later. I mean, it's not the end of the world to do it later if you have to, but yeah. And Mike, Mike's follow-up question. I've also had inspectors. Go ahead. I've had inspectors in the past that were fine with uh, us just photographing, uh, you know, like in particular, like braced wall corners and just us photographing our nail patterns on those corners and just proving to them, you know, documenting it. So it really depends on your authority that you're working with. Yeah. I, I've had that experience with inspectors saying the photos were okay as well. And someone else, someone else commented the same thing. So that must be pretty, that must be kind of common. Um, Mike had followed up that with a, a question about your choice to build. And I think if, if I'm not, uh, Mike, if you're still here and I'm not asking this correctly, please uh, jump in again. But he was asking you to discuss uh, your choice to build the walls individually, separately versus I guess building them together and standing both walls simultaneously. Well, you like with a common plate. Uh, he wasn't specific, but I would guess that what is what he meant. Yeah. Well, first of all, it'd be really heavy. Uh, second of all, you'd have a you have to use whatever. I guess you could use plywood rips or something, but you have to use two by twelves, which you know are expensive and uh, are more likely to come from old growth trees. Uh, and then it's also a thermal bridge. I mean, not a huge one, but it is. Um, and frankly, the, the interior wall flies up. I mean, that's, of everything we do, that's the easiest. You know, one of the things we have talked about, we actually had a company Zoom meeting a week or two ago, and we were talking about uh, this webinar and, and what are there things that we have done that we would think about changing. And one of the things that people said was, yeah, we, we'd rather, we think it makes sense to build both walls, not, not together, but to build, get both walls up before we start building the second floor of the roof, um, that it's easier than trying to stand them later when there's load on it. Uh, and also, you know, with that plywood rip that, that, that Ben showed, the zip rips, um, it makes a really nice platform once that second wall is up. You know, it gives you a really wide area to stand when you work to work on top of. Yeah, so Dan, uh, one person did ask about I think some people are under the assumption when you talk about a double stud wall that you're talking about it as a complete assembly, but you guys treat it like the interior as a separate piece, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I did one years ago where we panel, where, where it was panelized, and on that one we did do a 2 by 12 or 2 by 10 I can't remember what the wall thickness was, and they framed both wall, you know, they arrived with the walls framed that way. But that was obviously in a fact, you know, they were building it in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a factory setting and they came with a crane and all that. Um, so I've never, I've never stick built with a, with a single plate. It seems to me like it'd be a big pain in the ass. Ben, you have an opinion? Just from my, yeah, from my perspective, it, doing them as separate walls we just have to make that one trip around the building and it puts us that much closer to getting the roof structure on and getting the building weathered in right and then at that point we can call subs in or we can have guys starting on exterior you know siding trim window installs while somebody else another crew's coming around the interior and doing interior walls so it just helps us get the building closer to closed up that much faster and, yeah. so, and it really is nice framing exterior walls with two by fours if you're used to doing it with two by sixes. I mean, it's, you know, you, f you forgot how light two by four walls are. And so if you do guys um, end up coming in later after the entire exterior is framed on more than one floor, are there any tricks to getting those interior walls up if you're, if you're worried about fitting tight to joists or, or trusses or anything like that? They don't have to fit that tight, frankly. In fact, it's obviously a pain if they do fit tight. Um, on this job, I think Ben kind of, you know, packed the, I think we were an inch, inch and a half low, and Ben just stuck some rocks all up to fill the gap. One thing we should mention is that with an eight inch, you know, we don't, some people do brick ledges to cut down the, the foundation at the top 
the width. We don't typically, since we're doing a 12 inch wall, we've got eight inches of, it, of foundation, then four inches, two to four inches of foam. Um, so often that interior wall isn't even sitting on anything. You know, it's kind of floating, either sitting on the foam or floating or whatever. So we typically, you know, just cut some plywood gussets to the thickness of the wall, whole entire wall, and use that to, to hold the wall out, you know, to hold the interior wall out a set distance from the exterior wall. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Am I good? We got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. so we had a, we had a question to... about uh, we had a question about the reliance of so, uh, uh, tapes for air sealing and the al alternatives. The person mentioned acoustical sealants, but there's also, I guess, all the there's a lot of different uh, fluid applied products these days. So, um, do you have any thoughts on? on choosing tapes versus fluid applied products? We love the fluid applied. I mean, Ben can talk more about yeah. that. But, you know, it's expensive and time consuming. So uh, like that base joint that I showed at the bottom of the wall earlier on in the presentation, uh, I used to do that with fluid applied um, because I wasn't totally sold yet on some of these tapes bonding well to concrete. Um, and the fluid applied works really well in that situation. It is expensive, it is time consuming, and it is messy to pull off. Um, and often requires a bit of fiddling with, you know, backer rods and stuff like that in order to seal up any inconsistencies in the foundation. So in that case, tape, you know, just in the labor savings pays for itself. Um, I'm also, I'm not sure if you were here before, uh, heard my comment I'm not a big fan of faith-based sealing uh, and what I mean by that is is where we're putting beads of sealant into assemblies and we can't visually inspect how well they've sealed and we just have to have faith that they're doing their job I'm not a big fan of those methods um, I want to be able to see you know connections that I can check visually and inspect and make that they are done co correctly and well uh, and that's just the fact that you know, we have an ever-changing salon crews that we have to deal with. We have these assemblies that have to be put in front of people. That you can look at than it is to hope that they got it right in between those two pieces of material. And, and acoustical sealant's just a mess to work with. I, no, thank you. <laughs> we had a question about the process of building the order for building your uh, building the interior walls, um, the person had had asked. Since you you mentioned that you modeled, you know, you you take off your um, your plate layout from for your interior walls from your exterior walls, but you know, then you're going to have a wall that is uh, the next wall is going to be shorter once you've got one wall stood up. So how do you choose um, in that order of building those interior walls? Is there any methodology for that? Then. You want to take that? I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure that I. Question. Yeah, I'm not sure that I totally follow. Yeah, I'm not sure that I totally follow what you're getting at. Well, I'm not sure that I understood it either. I think that I I I think that the 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 point was that you can only do that on one wall because then the adjacent wall is going to be shorter. It's not going to run all the way. It's not going to run the same length as the exterior wall. Right. I mean, we're leaving. Yeah, so what? Know. So what I do is, yeah. I... Go ahead, Ben. No, you go ahead, Dan. It's all you. I mean, I don't think the short version is. I don't think it really matters, right? I mean, it's just you got to leave because even that the second wall, you know, you still want to be, you still want to have that five inches in between whatever the intersecting wall is. So you're stopping short. If that answers it. Uh, somebody else also asked. I see somebody, Casey. Kuntz just asked this question about um, double top plates and sill plates um, and 69 center. So in this job in particular, it was kind of dumb luck that it worked out perfectly um, for to get the ceiling height we wanted. Well, it wasn't dumb luck. We used pre-cut studs and we wanted to have the inch and a half of strapping below the ceiling. So to get the right ceiling height, we used pre-cuts and four plates and we ended up with the right height. So it was a hell of a lot better and probably more efficient use of materials than having to buy, you know, 10 foot studs and cutting them all. 
um, but certainly there's no problem. The only issue I'd say is, and in terms of the advanced framing on the exterior wall, you know, I've had on some jobs where we tried to do it, um, you know, a lot of engineers, you probably have to go to two, you might have to go to two by sixes. Um, I've had engineers who would not sign off on two by fours, two feet on center, especially if the studs are more than eight feet. Um, so there's no reason not to, but you'd have to, you'd have to make sure the engineer is willing to do it. Um, do we want to pop over here real quick and just show um, some ways of doing second floor assemblies in a double stud house um, that I think we touched on in the article, but didn't really dive into too deeply? Sure. Sounds great. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So, da, da, da. Yeah, and then if you've got some good images in okay. the room, might as well just keep them up while we're talking too, just so people have something cool to look yeah. at. Instead of our gnarly faces, so um, a couple of a couple of ways uh, that we like to address doing second floor systems in the houses is you have you know your typical oh, hold on a second bear with me I'm trying to get it to behave we have our typical wall frame assembly and something that we like to do is we like to put in two inches of foam here either poly iso or eps uh, for high r value and low embodied energy and what this does is this gives us a thermal break right here at the rim which is a vulnerable spot to thermal bridging uh, and one way that you can deal with hanging your floor system then is, is you can uh, we've in the past had a two by six ledger specified here with a specific screw pattern of four inch screws that goes in and then your floor system just goes down like a traditional one, uh, toe nailed through the rim or nailed from the outside in through the rim. It sits on top of uh, that ledger there or alternatively you can go, it's probably a little bit more costly, but same approach as you can go to a hangered approach. So we've got a thermally broken rim right here and then our floor system hanging off of it at that point. Uh, I know this, spot right here makes Justin Fink cringe when I first sent this to him he thought I was crazy but that is all the bearing that you need per code and uh, any structural engineer unless it's a really strange situation is going to be fine with an inch and a half continuous bearing right down there through that room. We also did a house uh, with actually with Mike Maines who is in the audience tonight uh, and on that one we instead of hanging we did a two by four as a ledger uh, and the engineer just came up with a fastening schedule uh, into the top plate and the studs. Um, and I think that was, I don't know, what do you think, Ben? It seems to me that that was probably easier than, than all those hangers, but maybe not. Yeah, that was this one. It was a two by six ledger at the top here. And yeah, it was just a, like a four inch screw into every stud and then one every 16 inches. So it's just kind of like doing a typical deck ledger. We had like, one screw mid bay here and then a screw into each one of the studs on a two by six. I think that works great. It makes it really nice for setting your floor system too because you can then just drop your joist right down there onto it and they're supported. Um, so yeah, I like that. It's also less steel and it's less hardware. It's probably more cost effective. Uh, I like this detail personally. This is the one I'd go with if I was building my house, but this is also a very easy option. Um, something that, that we haven't talked about, and while I've got the model open, is worth mentioning. Um, so we have our rain screen cavity right here, this ventilated cavity. And I, I'm sure everybody here in the audience is probably familiar with the purpose of a rain screen cavity. It's to create a, you know, convective drying potential inside here through airflow movement and allow bulk water to drain out into the ground. Something that we did here on this project that I've only done once before, and it's a detail that I really like, is we actually have our rain screen cavity connects here at the top of the wall up and ties in and functions as our soffit vent for our attic space. So this does two things. It allows us to get our uh, required venting that we need for our attic space, our net free area, without having to have, you know, some sort of you know, physical um, perforation through our soffit material here in order to get that venting. And it also then boosts the amount of convective flow that we're getting through this wall assembly at the same time, because we're going to have stack effect happening. The attic space is going to be heating up and it's going to be naturally drawing air from down here at the base of the wall right up through here, drying the entire wall assembly out and convecting it out through the roof. 
Uh, and when I first addressed this at the summit last year with some people, you know, everybody says, oh, you're going to be dumping moisture into the seal. You're going to be dumping moisture into the attic. The amount of moisture that you're going to be drawing from here is no different than the amount of moisture you're going to be drawing off of the ground after a rainstorm. So there's really no concern with, you know, drawing too much moisture. Your relative humidity out here is going to be the same as it is inside this cavity, or at least close enough that it's not for any reason to be concerned about. So it's no issue there. If anything, you're just promoting the durability of your building by it drying across. Uh, other little things just to note on rain screens, above windows and below windows, you never want to run your battens all the way tight to your box here. You want to allow it to cross communicate because otherwise, this area of the cavity, if it goes, your batten runs all the way up here to the bottom of the window buck, it can't then cross communicate and actually convect up and tie out. If you're not tying into the software right here, you can do funny little details with freeze bands and stuff like that in order for that top of cavity to be able to bend down and out behind a piece of trim at the top of your siding. Yeah, Doug just makes a good point. We ran this by, you know, there are some issues uh, I mean, first of all, I just want to say it's a great detail. It was Ben's idea and it looks fantastic. I'm sure like many of you, I really hate the way soft event looks. Um, but we did talk to the CEO about, you know, because there could be some concerns about fire, it being a chase or a chimney for fires. Um, I can't remember if he really thought about it too much or he just said, yeah, that's fine. Um, but anyway, we definitely, you should definitely run it by your code enforcement. Uh, the first project that I ever did this detail on where I picked this up, the architect who actually originally spec'd it, uh, was for a passive house retrofit at a summer camp. And we had to install uh, two inches of Roxwell, Roxel, rock wool now, uh, loosely at the top of the cavity as a draft stop. Um, not a draft stop, as a spark arrest was the technical term that he was after um, because there was concern about uh, drawing sparks up through here from close campfires and up into the roof assembly. Um, so that is a potential issue if you're in, you know, oh, what is it, urban wildland interface zone where you have high likelihood of wildfires. That's probably not a detail you want, but it's also one that you could probably be worked around with some sort of spark arrest screening in there as well. And I just want to say the people that we know personally are giving us a really hard time. And I'm starting to get kind of ticked off. So I ignored this question the first time around, but, but this time I'm going to ask it because I think it might be the same person who asked it twice. Um, and that they, want, they would like you to discuss um, why, why this system and not a, a wall with exterior rigid foam or exterior insulation, I should say. Right. Um, yeah, we talked about this at the very beginning. Um, you know, there's a few reasons. One is uh, f from a building, you know, from the carpenter's perspective, I at least find exterior foam to be a huge pain in the ass. I've done it a couple of times and uh, it just seemed, you know, it's, it's time consuming. You're going around the building multiple times. You got to figure out how you're going to attach your siding. Flashing is harder. Air sealing is harder. Uh, everything just seems to me like it's, it's much harder. Um, plus, uh, at least in, uh, in North, you know, in our climate zone, uh, you want things to be able to, I, it's nice for things to be able to dry to the exterior, right? Our vapor drive in the heating season is to the exterior. So it, it always makes me nervous to be sealing up your exterior like that. Um, and again, foam is, you know, always going to be more, Foam is, you know, the blowing agents keep getting better, but foam is always going to be worse for the environment uh, than most other alternatives. People are pointing out that uh, a couple of people have mentioned Gutex and, and, and which it would be a vapor open possibility. And we, we, are, we already discussed mineral wool a little bit and it's, it's global warming potential, but in terms of vapor um, permeability, that would be that could be used on exterior walls, um, just to add a little bit more to that. So then we, there's a discussion going on in the chat about, um, about choosing the exterior wall as the, as the load bearing wall. And so I guess to put that to you guys, have you ever thought or considered any reasons why you might um, consider having the interior wall instead be the bearing wall? Are there any situations or benefits that might arise from doing that? No. 
<laughs> they were saying kind of, you know, why wouldn't you treat the exterior wall sort of like a Larson trust? Yeah, I mean, that's I've that's not a, that's not uncommon. Right. It, and, that's, and, I actually just heard somebody recently that was coming to me questioning that they were going to be doing a double stud wall assembly where the exterior was a, you know, the interior was a two by six bearing wall and the exterior was a two by four balloon frame, you know, 18 foot wall or something like that. Uh, it does cut down a little bit at the bridge and uh, the thermal bridging at the second floor there, um, which we handle with that foam detail. Um, it's a viable option. I think ours just kind of streamlines the the speed of buildability and our ability to get the the building under cover and weathered in and allow us to get trades in that much faster instead of having to, you know, handle these big 16, 18 foot wall balloon frame walls and, you know, shifting the structure, you know, we're trying to keep it as familiar to traditional building methods as possible, because then that means it's accessible to everybody and it doesn't require any special thought or special training or, you know, special details or anything like that. Keep it simple, stupid. So would you guys talk a little bit about your, your, your data logging efforts in these walls and what you've, what you've found? And, and actually, you know what, uh, in, in that conversation, it's probably a good idea. You know, we talk a lot about in the article about how to build one of these houses, but obviously different parts of the country or even Canada, you're gonna, it's gonna be harder. The more complicated thing is just deciding how thick, what sort of layers to add to your, your building. Um, you know, how do you find, how have you taught yourself about how to, how to figure that all out? Sorry about that. I hope you I hope you moved on without me. <laughs> uh, as far as like tuning the assembly, well, we kind of just have our you know generally we're either a ten inch or a twelve inch wall, um, and that really just depends kind of on what the client's goals are and what the budget is of the project. Um, it can sometimes depend on what setbacks we have to deal with on the property and what we are trying to get for maximizing floor space and that type of situation. Um, so we know that our assembly using the drywall and the paint is the vapor retarder on the inside with either plywood or OSB and a ventilated brain screen. We know that that works for us. Um, as far as how to tune it, um, something that I keep you know, telling people is when you're in pre-construction on a project, one of the best things you can do is hire an energy rater or somebody that does energy modeling to look at a couple of different wall assemblies, roof assemblies for you and make your decisions based off of that. And um, I, what... just, I just noticed there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in the Q and A. Uh, if those people could do it in the chat, that would probably work better. Ben, would you, um, would you, uh, discuss that just a little bit more the if you if you were um, unable to do your own energy modeling and you're building a house that so you wanted to kind of get an idea of whether your assemblies were um, going to meet your performance goals at what point during the design process um, do you start to work with an energy rater as soon as you have a schematic design or conceptual design you know, as soon as you kind of know what the footprint of the house is that you want it to be, you know, in general room layout and shape and form, that's really when you start bringing a, you know, somebody do modeling in because you may then at that point have to shift your layout a little bit depending on what your, you know, wall assembly becomes and your goals are and that type of thing. But yeah, the earlier the better. Yeah, and once you have all the factors in, it's easy to play with different things, you know, improving your windows, making your wall thicker, thinner, um, you know, you can all see that. And speaking of which, that actually is a good lead into something Mike Maines asked earlier about monitoring. Um, so I mentioned it briefly in the article, and actually Ben is working on a piece right now on uh, monitoring, which should be out one of these days in a future issue. But anyway, for our last maybe three or four projects, uh, including one we did with Mike, we have been burying uh, monitors that Omnisense makes. Uh, they're a great company down in, I forgot where, in the south, southeast. Uh, um, North, Car North Carolina? Yeah, I can't remember. Um, anyway, um, it's kind of a one-man shop, and he makes, he makes um, monitors that you can bury. They have batteries that will last for 
you know, who knows, years, five, at least five years. Um, you can get them for different things. Typically what we're doing is uh, relative humidity, temperature, and wood moisture equivalents are the ones we're most interested in. It also is doing, I think, absolute humidity and dew point, um, which are interesting, but not as interesting. Um, so anyway, we've been burying them in a few different spots. You know, we'll always pick a wall on the north side. Um, we'll try to get one in the roof assembly somewhere. On some of them, we've been doing ambient temperature too. Uh, and on this job, actually, we just did one, a CO, uh, CO2 monitor in the inside of the house that connects with the system. On other jobs, we had a FUBOT going, uh, which we've left in a client's bedroom just to see how the ventilation system was going. Um, so anyway, that has confirmed, you know, that we that the wall assemblies are reasonably safe. Um, we, they're not tipping into the danger zone for significant periods of time. Um, so anyway, I would encourage everyone, if you're doing this stuff, to look into uh, monitoring in general and Omnisense in particular, because we do make a lot of assumptions that everything's great. And on the other hand, Woofy tells us that we're going to fail miserably. And I think it's important to have your own data. Um, and I think not, at a certain point, I decided that not doing this kind of modeling was kind of um, being irresponsible, that it was uh, malpractice, that we needed some data to back up what we were saying. Dan, did you say how much those, uh, those sensors cost? No, I don't think I did. It's it's a not, you know, it's an it's it's not insignificant. Um, you're probably going to spend. I don't know. You know, I don't even remember five hundred to a thousand on the equipment, depending on how many you do. You also have to buy a gateway, which is uh, what, you know, connects the monitors to the internet. You use the you use the client's Wi-Fi, um, and then there's also a monthly monitoring fee. Mm -hmm. um, that Omnisense charges, which obviously the more houses you do, uh, the less per house it costs. I, I think on average, generally we're bearing about four sensors in the building uh, and the wireless gateway and our you know total hardware bill is about 550 or 600 bucks, something like that, um, which in you know the grand scheme of the job is, you know, a, a bad morning can cost us more than that. So, um, you know, it's not cheap, but it's also our due diligence of making sure that our buildings are performing as we say they will. And so far we've been watching them, you know, about three years now is our oldest buried set and the walls are performing exactly like we expect them to. Actually this time of year is when I really start watching them because this is the danger zone where should be getting hairy for our wall assemblies and they do exactly like we predict them to the relative humidity goes up to about 90 percent the temperature outside comes up and the wall dries back out and drops into a safe zone so no concerns yeah thanks arnold arnold richter just put up a, a link um and i see justin is bugging us uh um, but before that, I'll answer that question in a sec, but I also just want to mention one other word. We haven't, it's not live yet, but we've actually, we've got a cool product uh, on the house we're currently building. Um, Leviton is making this thing called the load panel, and it is uh, circuit by circuit monitoring built right into your panel. Um, you don't have to monitor all your circuits because it's 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 in the breaker. The monitoring is in the break. You have to buy special breakers for the circuits you want to monitor. Um, but we've done some other projects where we've tried to monitor, like we tried to use the sense, uh, which probably some of you have, and it doesn't pick up doesn't pick up um, ECM motors very well, which heat pumps are full of. So anyway, we're very excited about this new panel, and you know whatever. Maybe there's an article on there someday too. Yeah, and Mike Maines just put a link to that. All right, so Justin's question. Can you circle back to how you handle two-story double stud structures? I'm curious if you platform frame or balloon frame and why. Um, we have always platform framed them. Um, again, it just seems like balloon framing is a pain in the ass. Um, I've looked at it before. You know, you gotta buy really long studs, again, which presumably gets you into old growth trees. And it just, I don't know, just the thought of lifting 20 foot walls just is pretty unappealing to me. 
Um, you know, the only downside is that spot where the rim is. And I think that we figured out a good way to handle that. You know, we have to use a little bit of foam, but it's a relatively trivial amount. You know, I know some people have balloon framed, but it seems like, I don't think, I don't think, the, the, I don't think the benefit's there. I don't know. Have you ever done it, Ben? Have you ever balloon framed? No, not on a project like this. And I'm, I, I don't really see the benefit. I, I understand that there's an energy pinch point there at that second floor rim. Um, I, I think we have to, you know, make some trade-offs here. You know, we're not going for uh, passive house levels where we're trying to meet some, some bar in the sky set out by some software for us, but we're trying to build a pretty good house, you know, we're trying to stay cost competitive to other builders in the area and deliver a product that's, you know, not only better performing, but is also good for the environment. And when we're doing that, we have to kind of weigh pros and cons. You know, if we're going for a, you know, money is no object, absolute best performance, there's a lot of different things that we could evaluate in our assemblies. But what we're trying to do is build a pretty good and attainable, you know, assembly here. There is um, also, you know, and on the time, the times when we bring the rim all the way out to the exterior, you know, the, the insulators just bring their webbing up into the bays above the wall and are dense packing that. Um, so there is our value up there. Uh, Nicholas asks if there would be any advantage to balloon framing so you wouldn't have a hinge point. I mean, it's just not any different than any other balloon framed house. Yeah. And someone, someone yeah. earlier, just something, right, ben. I mean, just something to, to pay attention to if you are doing that exterior foam uh, at the rim joist is, is you want to make sure here, I'll screen share real quick, just so we can all look at it. Um, you just want to make sure that, you know, and this is totally just me being the carpenter thinking like a carpenter here. You want to make sure that your sheathing joints break of your top plate you don't want to have a sheathing joint breaking right here in the middle because at that point you need a four inch plus nail something like that in order to get proper fastening right there and it can create a pucker in that area so you just if you're going to do this detail that's just basically one of the only thing bridges across plate to plate fully there so you're not trying to nail a seam in the middle and you also want to rip that foam a little bit wide so you're compress, you know, so you're compressing it. Dan, someone had asked uh, about your comment about uh, mineral wool. Um, if you have, <laughs> if you have a preference between mineral wool, when, when you need to make a choice uh, between mineral wool and, uh, and rigid foam products, and he specifically said, you know, the, the embodied energy in mineral wool versus the off-gassing of uh, foam, and I don't know if you have any any knowledge about about that but if you do that was one question yeah I, i'm not ben might be better at keeping up with those those specific numbers and actually mike mains if he wants to weigh in on the comments i know he is much more informed than i am on that stuff um you know whatever rockwell i whatever i, I if i had to do bat insulation i'd be happy with it but it's a pain in the ass frankly mm. I just don't see any reason to use it. You know, I think they're both avoidable. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's a sub slab. And at one point there were all these people talking about using Rockwell um, there. There was that comfort board or whatever that supposedly had the compressive strength. Um, I've never done it. I know, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if it ever got, it was code approved supposedly in some European countries. I don't know if they ever got it approved in the US. All right. Well, we're at uh, we're at seven oh eight, and uh, I think we've I think we've exhausted most of the questions or the uh, all that I've I've caught anyway. So, um, do you, if you guys have anything else that you feel like we haven't covered, uh, let's do it now. Otherwise, we can uh, we can start to we can start to close this out. Oh, here's Mike. Uh, he says mineral wool. Mineral embodied carbon depends to some degree on the manufacturer and type, but it's always higher than cellulose. So he didn't say anything about the, the rigid foam yet. I think a rigid foam we can't we can't generalize about anyway because I know that XPS, for example, has 
pretty high global warming potential versus uh, polyiso and EPS. So I think you have to look specifically at the, the type of foam that you're choosing. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Just um, don't fill the walls full of spray foam. Exactly. Please don't do that. Yeah, you know, I, I again, I think that this, I really do think that this is the best way, especially if you're new to it. It's the best way to build a good it sh to build a good house. It's testable. Everything's visible. Everything is stuff you've already done. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot more. I think it's a lot more idiot proof than other assemblies. Yeah, and we're certainly idiots. <laughs> All right, well, I uh, also want to say, feel free to get in yeah. touch with us. You know, our websites, it's Colbert Building with a K, um, colbertbuilding.com. You can email us through that. Uh, you know, I'll pass it on to benefits for him. But please feel free to, to get in touch with stuff. Um, and also, you know, several of the people involved that are on are uh, involved in this, but you know, the Pretty Good House came out of the discussion group here in Portland. And we recently put up a website that we're trying to develop more. Um, Emily Matram, who I know is in the audience, is uh, largely responsible for the website. So check that out. That's been a very fun project uh, that a lot of the BS and beers are picking up on too. Great. Awesome. And uh, one final parting thing for me, uh, we're currently involved in the Wall Assembly Suite 16 on Instagram being hosted by uh, Travis Brungart, Kansas City BS and Beer. Uh, we are in the final four now. We'd really appreciate if you popped over to Instagram and put a vote in for our Wall Assembly. Right. We're going to find out if we have to crush Bayzac or Mains pretty soon. <laughs> Good luck, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.